Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our session, Legacy Talkback with Gerhard Zeiler. Here is our moderator, Executive Editor, Broadcasting and Cable, Melissa Grego. Hi. Good, <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm so, um, so thrilled to be able to be the person to ask the tough questions of Gerhard Zeiler here. Um, Please join me in, in welcoming him and congratulating him on being one of this year's Tartikoff Legacy Award honorees. Um, so big hand for Gerhard. Thank you. Welcome. Um, as you may know, he is um, one of the most successful television executives in the world. Um, overseeing RTL Group um, means he oversees some 40 television channels, 37 or so radio stations, and a little company called Fremantle Media, which you may know from some of the teeny tiny shows that air in the United States, like American Idol, America's Got Talent, right? And um, the upcoming X Factor, which are, are huge hits globally as well. Um, I would love to start by talking a little bit about um, some of these shows that do play around the world. Um, there's a show last night, the second episode of Skins on MTV aired last night. Um, I don't know if we have ratings yet, but they're expected to be pretty big following um, some uproar. Um, this is a show that was originated in the UK, I believe, and has translated to um, big uh, uproar from the Parents Television Council. A bunch of advertisers have bailed on the show, um, and yet, as Steve Morrison of All Three Media, which backs the show or is, is the company behind it, said yesterday, uh, it's just aired to nothing but five-star reviews, you know, elsewhere um, on the BBC and BBC America here. So, what do you make of that? What do you make of a show um, that, in in one place in the world, is just a critical darling, and in another place, the source of uproar? To be honest, we see that quite often, not only if you compare the US with Europe, but also within Europe. Uh, Big Brother, for example, is a cult show and won many awards in the UK and is seen and perceived more like a trash show in Germany, for example. And the difference is the channels they are broadcasted at. And I think this also shows for me the strength um, of of the channel brands. If you have a channel which is perceived as a quality um, um, channel, then you can broadcast a lot, even provocative um, uh, programs and shows, and it doesn't hurt you, and it's not seen. Um, and if you uh, broadcast it on a channel which is more male, young oriented, then you have the reviews you have with skins here at MTV. Very interesting. Well, speaking of um, where something airs and, and how it performs and how it's perceived, um, so there's th this huge anticipation for The X Factor coming up on Fox, um, which is, of course, the network that also airs American Idol. Um, how do you think X Factor is going to do this fall? It will do fantastically. And because we, we now have to balance it between the two Simons, and we have um, American Idol um, just now, and we have X Factor, and we hope also um, with Fox that both shows will be a huge hit. Now, based on how these shows do around the world and, and what you know about the formats, um, do you think that X Factor has a chance? Do you think it'll do better in the ratings than American Idol does now? Do you think when it debuts? Out of many reasons, I stay out of forecasting, <laughs> um, uh, politically speaking, uh, but I'm not a good forecaster with that. But, but I, I'm pretty much sure that because of the strength of the format, that X Factor will be also a success in the US. It is more or less all over the world. And what it shows that all two formats can live in one market, that you can see in Germany, you can see it um, uh, in France, uh, you could see it in the Netherlands, it's working. All right, so you're not gonna, you're not gonna make a guess for No, me. I don't make the mistake. And, <laughs> um, uh... um, now, well, if it doesn't do better, will you still consider it a success? Does it have to do as, as big of numbers as American Idol? Look, the first season um, is always a decisive one, 
but you can't forecast it. If you look at the first season of, of Pop Idol, of American Idol, it didn't have the numbers, the ratings, the shares of the second, the third, or the fourth season. Right. So you need a time to build up. But um, uh, how many questions you ask me about the tool, <laughs> I will not take sides. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Gerhard, one of the things that you've said um, is that you believe the future of TV is TV. Tell me what you mean by that. Um, it, first of all, it's a great headline, um, and everybody um, is listening to when I say that. But what I mean is that within the last years, um, a lot of people, journalists, some analysts, were repeating that, what I already have heard in the years 1999, 2000s, before the internet or during the internet bubble. Mm -hmm. um, sentences like, the end um, of TV is in sight. I 100% believe that this is not true. Because let's see the facts. First, TV viewing, and I mean, non -linear, I mean linear TV viewing, is up in every single country of the world in the last years. Second, if you look at the, at the water cooler programs, the event programs you have, they're still there. Mm -hmm. And not only in the US, it's not only American Idol or Dancing with the Stars, for example, Last week, we had two shows in the Netherlands with a 50%, 5 0% plus share. Yesterday, we had in Germany a show with 47% share. So they exist. And these are the show people are talking, newspapers are writing about. Um, third is that when you, when you look at it, nonlinear viewing actually is not yet cannibalizing, it's additional viewing. Mm -hmm. And the fourth, for me, most important um, data when I look at the future is that, that contrary to linear TV, non-linear TV is not adding to the fragmentation. The audience shares of the big shows in non-linear are higher mm -hmm. than in linear. And that's quite logical. What do you watch on your computer, on your screen, on demand? That's what you missed. That's why we call it catch-up TV. Mm -hmm and you miss the big shows. And for, for companies like ours, where we have the, the number one and number two shows in the market and the number one and number two stations in the market, that's quite good news. So all in all, um, I, I really believe that, um, yeah, the future of TV is TV. So you had a couple of shows, you, you just mentioned that, that got like 47% yeah. share, 50% share. Um, how do you explain that? How, how, do, how, how does a show do that? You know, what, what is it that about a show? What makes a, a, a successful show? Tell, tell me about those shows. Where did they air? What were they like? How long have they been on um, the air? There is, there's, the German show is called Celebrity Get Me Out of Here. It's actually ITV Productions, unfortunately not from us. Okay. And it's about celebrities in the Australian jungle, a little bit, um, a little bit like Survivor. Survivor, when it arrived here in the US, mm -hmm. um, must have been 2000 or 2001, had also almost a 40% share, when I remember correctly. Uh, the other one in Holland is a show like Farmer Won't Survive, which is a national, I don't know, the national program with um, almost 60% share. People are watching it on a Sunday night. It's not a dating show, as the title may, uh, it's more, it's heartwarming, uh, you can see people you normally don't see. There are different reasons. Yeah. But I believe you only can really have a successful TV program if, and that Brandon Tartikoff really taught us, if it's relevant mm -hmm. for our lives, if it gets in our hearts, it has to touch us in one way. If it's original, you never can have these um, ratings with a copy. And if it's executed brilliantly in every sense of the word. But if you have that and you're a little bit, of, uh, you're a little bit lucky, then you get shows like uh, Talent, X Factor, uh, Pop Island, and others where you have this effect of a water cooler show where everybody talks about it. Yeah, I have a couple things to ask you about what you just said. One is really more of a statement. It, it, your story about I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, really speaks to your other point about things playing differently around different territories, right? Because that's a show that lasted, you know, two seconds here in the U.S. on 
on ABC, but it's this ginormous show in <laughs> gigantic show in Germany, right? That's it's in right. Germany, and it's the reason, the difference is that uh, an event show, it's 14 days every day at 10 p.m. Um, so it's different than you have it yeah. um, two days a week here in the U.S. Um, the other thing is there, there are a lot of people here at NatP in the business of selling their television around the world. Um, and so I'm curious how output deals uh, within, you know, with U.S. suppliers and American product. How does that play into your future plans with your channels? The, the output of American TV is always, was always, is and will always be very important for Europe. No doubt about that. And there are ups and downs. There were times where you don't have one or, we only had one or two American series in primetime television, for example, in Germany and France. And you had times like in the last five years where in France the biggest shows at all were American product, were Mentalist, um, uh, were CSI, were Crazy Anatomy. Yeah. And Germany it was not much different. It's ups and downs. I believe that we have seen now probably the ceiling of the impact. Local content will be, especially fictional content, will be more important um, in the future for the next phase for the next wave. Local, but, fi uh, local meaning indigenous to yes, the territory. Yes, in, in, in okay. German, French, Over Spanish. Over American yeah. product, okay. But you need both. Um, you need, if you want to be a number one and number two station, you can't really only focus on one genre. Mm -hmm. But in the output deals uh, and, and the volume deals are still very important because we in Europe have something what we call family of channels. We not only have one channel. Mm -hmm. We need in every single county two, three, four, five channels. And there we always have one or two channels who focus solely on American product. Now, you are known to be truly one of the most successful executives at, at running television networks and channels. I'm wondering if you can share with us, without tipping your hand too much, but just some of your tenets or guiding principles for, you know, what do you do, what can you do to run a successful TV network? Um, I think the most important um, thing for me is you have to be passionate about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's TV, it's about programs, it's about getting into the hearts of your viewers. I, I strongly believe that it's content, the right program, but it's also about the positioning the channel brands. Mm -hmm. And the, the more channels you have in the market, the more important the brand and the positioning is. So both together mm -hmm. is really important. And, and also, it's not only about money. If it had been only about money, commercial TV would not have been so successful in Europe because the podcasters were 20 years ago and still are in a lot of countries um, really have deep pockets. So it's also about being new, daring something to do. And one thing is really important. You have to have a culture of allowing people to make mistakes. We have a headline in our group saying, fail often, but fail fast and fail cheaply. Um, uh, so we have managed the first thing. Not so really the second and third yet, but we are working on that. <laughs> what are some of your favorite mistakes? One of the best, fast, cheap, often mistakes? Um, you do a lot of mistakes. You do a lot of mistakes in this job. Um, sometimes you hire the wrong people. And the most important thing is that you, that you have to admit that. I mean, if, let's not forget, in the US, probably two thirds of the new programs are not renewed. Um, for a second season. So if, if an executive producer um, uh, would be really only looking at the past, which flops he had, he wouldn't have the, the passion, he wouldn't have the confidence to look forward. Mm -hmm. you have to, if you make a mistake, analyze what the mistake was and immediately focus on the next thing. That's, that's really important. If people in our business start to be anxious about the next, mis next mistake, fire them. 
So I have a two-sided question for you about American television. Um, is there a network in the US, broadcast or cable of any kind, that you look at? Or actually, well, let's start with the US. And then if, if you'd like, then open it up to the world. That you admire, that you wish, that, that something that you don't own in the world, particularly if it's in the US, that you would you really admire the way that I have to that say, when, when, when I started in this industry, the, what, what we did was really looking at the US. This, the US, this industry, um, was our idol. We looked how they programmed, we looked how they scheduled, we looked which new program ideas came out. And in the meantime, yes, we, we have a lot of experience ourselves, yes, we are more self-confident, but still the US is and will be the most important um, country within TV, still. There was a time where ABC was my number one. Mm -hmm. Then there was a time where NBC was my number one. Um, there was a time where Fox was a number one. And to be honest, the last years, I really admire what Leslie Moonves did with CBS. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember 10, 12 years ago, everybody was saying CBS will die simply because the people were so old, the average. Now look at it, it's really competitive, so great work. That's the difference to most of the European landscape. Um, in the US, is, you can easily go from number one to number four, from number four to number one within a couple of years. Mm -hmm. In Europe, this, the, the landscape is much more stable. Well, my flip side to that is, um, do you see a, a recurring mistake that is made or something that could be done that you see coming out of the US that, you know, hey guys, I, I you keep not, doing that same thing. I would, not, I would not say mistake. The one thing which is different between the US and, and um, Europe is that in the US, you had for so many decade, decades, more or less in prime time, only two showers, drama and sitcoms. Whereas in Europe, there is much more you have magazines, you have entertainment, you have variety shows, you have the local trauma. So, and that's, in my opinion, also one of the reasons why the leadership changes in the US quite often compared to Europe. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's a mistake, um, uh, but that's one of one distinctive difference between the US networks and the European networks. Interesting. So, um, last year you divested your interest or your ownership in Channel 5 in the UK. How was that for you? Did, how disappointing was that for you? We were very disappointed that we had to do that. And it was simply out of the fact that um, we didn't see a chance to get a, to a number two position mm -hmm. without taking to a big risk. We already put a lot of money into Five and then sometimes it's better to say that was it and start somewhere else fresh. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also learned a lot of that. Yeah. You have to be in our industry. If you really want to be secure, if you really want to be profitable, if you really want to make a difference, you should look to be either number one or number two in a market. If you're not number one or number two, try to get to the number two position at least or get out of the market. Do you see yourself trying to get back into the UK at some point? That's always um, the speculation. But to be honest, let's see how it develops. And the, the landscape, the TV landscape in the UK is really different from the US and from the rest of Europe. You have such a strong BBC. Mm -hmm. uh, you have more, more or less, for long years, you had a monopoly of commercial televisions, ITV. You don't have a second big commercial station there. Channel 4 will only have a 7% share or 7.5% share. And then you have B Sky B. So it's different. Yeah. There are, whether there will be an opportunity to get into it, I don't know. But if there's an opportunity, we will look at that. Now, you've also said you'd be interested in getting into Asia, correct? Yes, because I think the next growth will come from Asia. We are in broadcasting, we are a European group, whether it's radio, TV. 
in production, in content, we are a global globe. And I think we have a chance if we go into Asia, uh, India, and, and other Asian states, maybe with a different concept, uh, maybe more pay TV channels, maybe we'll start smaller, but Asia, that's definitely a place where we want to be in five to 10 years. Now, um, let's go back to looking at a little bit of what's going on here in the US. Um, how closely are you watching this push for broadcasters to get cash compensation for the retransmission consent? We are, as you can imagine, we look um, quite deeply into that. And I like Robert Murdoch's sentence that um, the distribution platforms, the cable operators, the satellite operators should share a, a small part of their profits with um, the networks yeah. in order to ensure that quality content is um, still on the air. I think we also in Europe will have um, to have this, let's call them discussion and talks, negotiations um, with the platform operators because a second revenue stream um, is definitely that what we need. And we have a different tradition in Europe. In Europe, most, in most of the countries, the networks had to pay in order to get access um, to cable. It was um, not that the US, in the US, the cable channels always got paid, only the networks didn't get. But actually, since the 92 Transmi Retransmission Act, they got other mm -hmm. um, payments like space right. for new channels and so on. I think this discussion will come to Europe and in the end there will be a compromise between the two sides and we will have our second revenue stream. Excellent. Well this morning there was a, a great conversation with a big executive from Netflix and one of the things that he was talking about was the fact that um, distribution such as they do with streaming of, of things is complementary to the other forms of distribution. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you see um, new digital platforms, mobile, on demand, all these things that are not the linear TV channel um, in your business. How do they fit into your business going forward? And, and how, how much of a revenue stream do you see coming from that? One is clear. We have to get our on demand, our catch up tea, what our non linear strategy right. And I think that in the, when it comes to the long tail, it probably will be more pay oriented. But when it comes to catch up, so the first three or seven days, I think it's just an expansion of our advertising based um, business. Mm -hmm. One thing which we will not do is we will not um, have the same fate as the music industry. We will not hand one company the key to our future. We will do it ourselves. And every, in every single European country, you have these catch-up TV platforms from the channels, and they are hugely successful in terms of audience shares, hugely. Uh, we will now have, the next, have to get into the next um, stage that the advertisers will also have to pay for it. And we only have to look what the American networks did, this plus three negotiations they did with the agencies and the advertisers, that will come next also in Europe. So I'm, I'm really convinced that uh, we will be successful. And the second thing is we will work not only on our own platforms, we will also deal with other third party platforms, mm -hmm. but under two conditions. First, we will not simply sell our programs. We will sell only the programs with our channel brands. Okay. And second, we will do the advertising. We will sell our advertising because we don't want to have anyone else to change dollars into cents. So meaning um, your shows on individual networks must be branded yes, within that? Yes, absolutely. OK. Now, you have a channel in Russia, correct? We are 30% shareholders of the sixth largest network there. Okay. What's it like doing business in Russia right now? Interesting. Um, actually, uh, we have 30%. Um, um, it doesn't make a big difference whether you have 30 or 40 or 20%. Mm -hmm. And they are treating us with respect, no doubt about that. It's also the only national network 
where at least from a Russian point of view, there is at least some critical news allowed. But I would lie if I would say we are running the channel. Mm. Uh, they have the majority and they are doing that. Do you like doing business there? Yeah, we, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but let's, we went in 2005 when uh, we thought that maybe the whole media landscape will develop more like in other Central Eastern European countries. Okay. Um, it has developed a little bit different. It's interesting to do business um, there. They are highly professional, yeah. but they're running their own show. Is there anything that you're learning through that process that you can apply to your businesses elsewhere, you know, being as unique as it is? Or is it just its own thing? The only thing what I would say is, but this is truth for all of our channels, I, I would like to do my own mistakes. Mm -hmm. Therefore, running the channels, having maturity is still the better situation when you are. Wherever you are. Wherever you are. Yeah. Um, I have just a couple of minutes. I, I um, have a couple sort of bigger picture questions about you individually. To, <laughs> to achieve the level that you've achieved, in this business. Um, it's a pretty singular thing. Not a lot of people um, have achieved as much as you have. And it takes weathering, you know, all kinds of things, whether it's corporate politicking, dealing with, you know, changing and, and in crisis financial situations. Um, what does it take to, to do it? To be I was Gerhard? lucky. <laughs> I was very lucky. And I, my, I was very lucky that I started, I started at a big corporation, public broadcast in Austria at the second level. Mm -hmm. Then four years later, I went to Germany and the task was to turn around um, 150, 200 people company from one position to another. And the third task was two years later to build up a channel from scratch. So I learned a lot on these three occasions and I had the luck to be in this position um, uh, and, for example, to start from scratch a channel to negotiate a satellite um, deal where I hired um, a lawyer and we went through 85 pages um, of legal language which we didn't understand at all in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But not a lot of my colleagues probably had done that. So it's, it's, it's a, I was lucky to have the experience. Well, knowing what you know now, and this is a question I always like to ask um, honorees of the Tartikoff Award, would you recommend this business to kids? Definitely. Out? Yeah? Definitely. It's a great business because um, it's fun. It's never the same every single day. You have the result every single day in terms of what the audience thinks of your decision, what the advertisers are thinking of your positioning, and um, you deal with creative people. Sometimes it's difficult. Um, I studied psychology, it helped. But um, all in all, it's great. Everything, every day, a new thing. Every day, a new crisis. Every day, a new project. Sometimes you're destroyed by the reaction of the viewers, and sometimes you are over the moon because they liked what you decided to put on the air. We, we have time for one question from the audience. I'm sorry I took all of his, his time, but there is a microphone here. Um, the lucky person, if you want to battle it out. Hello, uh, my name's Anita. I'm a reporter with C21 in London. Hi. I really wanted to ask you, you mentioned Asia earlier. Which countries in Asia are most attractive to you and why? India is for sure very attractive from the sheer size um, here and um, also because um, the level of democracy so is there that you can as a foreign company you can get into there and you, you hopefully can be successful. So I prefer India to other uh, big um, so states to do business there. So would you be looking for there. a partnership or would it be something you'd like to have as a setup? Uh, we, we are 
in the talks of having that, but it's not, not, not a decision has been made, so I don't want to announce anything. But yes, when it comes to regions, whether it's Asia or one day maybe Latin America, we always prefer to have a local partner who knows the cloud. That have a majority interest, right? Yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, wonderful, thank you so much for taking the time with thank us you. today. And yeah, please thank you, Jeff. Thank you.